I, I was interested in these people you refer to as practitioners. Mm -hmm. Do they consider themselves to be medical practitioners? And do they also have other cures in store? So if I go there with a sore thumb or broken bone, mm. but then would they treat that as well? Or are they, strictly speaking, mercury specialists? And how mm -hmm. do they acquire the trade? Do they learn it? Uh, is it passed down from father to son, for instance? Mm -hmm. Or is there a sort of organization of mercury traders who, we, who meet on a monthly or annual basis? And mm -hmm. are they part of a wider sort of set of practitioners or mm -hmm. um, herbalists and so on? Yep. There's a whole uh, diversity of practitioners, and there is one category very much uh, of, let's say, traditional, as they refer to it now, traditional Myanmar medicine. Let's say the Burmese equivalent of Ayurveda because it has many areas where, where it's very similar, and also similar in that it shares also a, uh, a kind of alchemical aspect in which mercury uh, is, it performs a, a key ingredient. So there were many practitioners I met who were in fact uh, had their uh, treated people for a variety of complaints often without mercury but using uh, indigenous plant medicines, uh, sometimes plant medicines combined with mercury in some cases. Most of them all had an alchemical forge in their backyard where they also were engaged in the uh, forging of their datlon and that wasn't specifically uh, as a medicinal substance in that, that case that would be used in their professional life, but for their own spiritual advancement, they were still involved in the forging of the mercuric uh, essence ball, datlon. Um, monks, uh, lay people, there's a, you know, a, a professor of physics from Rangoon University, there was a retired hydroelectric engineer, there was uh, a whole variety of often very educated, uh, very well-spoken practitioners who this was what they had devoted their life to. Several, you know, who were, once they were retired, this was what they pr uh, preoccupied them. And there were several of practitioners who were very conversant with internet, you know, who were there asking questions about monoatomic gold and other things that you find sort of on New Age sites now, very, very engaged in trying to understand their own tradition in light of what's sort of happening both historically and contemporarily in other parts of the world today. So there's a great variety. I, I think I'm missing one part of your question yeah, though. Is there an association? Oh yes. Yeah, yeah that, that's very important actually. The way they're what called yang gangs, uh, and they are kind of schools of or groups of uh, practitioners whose practice derives from a particular transmission because there's a great variety in the way that uh, the alchemical work is carried out. Different prescriptions, different treatises that have been handed down over time. Uh, so different groups have formed that favor one particular line of transmission over another. And there's usually a particular teacher involved um, in that process by which particularly during the summer summer range retreats, if, the, if that uh, main uh, teacher happens to be a monk because they actually have to stay at the monastery during that period. So for example, the figure I showed of a kind of a, uh, with the shaved head and holding a fan up, um, he's now, it's actually where I would have been <laughs> this week because he, there's a, a two month intensive where he practices alchemy and where a lot of his close disciples come from Rangoon about six hours away to where his monastery is uh, to practice intensively during the summer rain period. But they don't normally stay for that whole two, three month period, but only for you know, a week or whatever amount of time they're able to devote to it. So there are different lines of transmission. There's also within the tradition, um, practitioners who use work exclusively with mercury, some who work with amalgamations of, of, of silver and mercury, uh, or even start with gold, or start with, sil uh, with copper, zinc, each of the different metals having different uh, associations. So you make your power ball, if you will. If you work with zinc, for example, it's considered to uh, be very, very uh, good for if you're going to do healing work. Uh, if you want to be involved in uh, love magic and coercion and magnetization, you work with, co with copper uh, and mercury together as a way of so that there are sort of different ways in which the alchemical work can be done to achieve different ends, depending on which other metals are added. And in many cases, and there's some practitioners who will add plants in at certain stages in the Datlon's development, um, including this wild, this orchid that I mentioned that's 
believed to have, it seems like it has psychoactive properties. And then there are others who never work with, with vegetal uh, material at all, but uh, only with metals and, and chemicals. So there's a, there's a whole variety of ways. As chair, I have a concern to maintain the coherence of the panel. Uh, could you just tell us something about dragon's milk very briefly uh, to return us to our theme of our yes. Why is it called dragon's milk? Good. Uh, the word in Burmese is nagama uh, yose, and the 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 naga or the the dragon. If you see in the lower right-hand corner here, this is an image of Mercury in, in this kind of stylized, uh, or you could say in this metaphoric form, as a substance to be transformed. Interestingly also, you see that form usually when it's representing Mercury, uh, I'll go back, I'm just, just the, the text there has no relevance to anything, so that's why. But you see it coiled like the Kundalini, which in Indian tradition represents the life force. So the dragon, in this sense, as it is also in China, it's, it's creativity, it's creative energy, it's power, uh, in this case, uh, representing the, the power, energy, and circulation of the waters in the, the outer world as well as in the body itself. Um, dragons are also associated uh, as a sort of beings which you know are not easily tamed or controlled. So the image of drinking the milk of a dragon is something that represents this kind of uh, attainment of supernatural capacities and abilities, this attainment of Siddhi. Um, and uh, by being able to drink, you know, being able to pacify a dragon to the point where you can actually drink its milk represents that you've, you've reached uh, a certain stage or, the, or have an orientation towards things that would um, uh, indicate uh, your, you know, uh, some kind of distinction from, from ordinary milk. The, um, I think the reason that milk is used is also because it's something that it's, it's, it's our first nourishing substance. Uh, and so, of course, the mother's milk, and here we have, you know, who are being suckled not by the mother, but by the dragon. It's again this idea of bridging of opposites. I think it's very alchemical in that sense that we're, um, you bring uh, one of the most nurturing and safest substances, milk, and associate that with something extraordinarily dangerous. In the Tibetan tradition, they talk about tiger's milk in the same way, where if you can drink the milk of a tiger, you've reached a certain kind of attainment. So I, I think it, it really comes from that. I think also because of the substance itself, I think it's such a mysterious and magical substance, mercury. It has that same kind of density and viscosity that, that milk does. It's that, that sort of silvery quality. Um, and because of the associations that mercury had as something that would prolong and preserve life, I think uh, just like milk does, I think in the same way that you know, the first emperor in China you know, had rivers of mercury nourishing him as in his, in his tomb. So I think it's something along that, and I think that, that's what's really fascinating, is it's, it's a primal substance that in this case, we're really here at the boundaries not of food and, uh, um, food and medicine, but really at poisons and, and, and nourishing substances, and what, what happens in that kind of stranger, even stranger interface, uh, where something either you know, could go terribly wrong and you die, or is it going to confer some kind of longevity? Uh, so I think that's the idea of milk in this case. Well, thank you very much mm. for bringing us a very striking paper from a country that is close to most of us. Mm. Thank you very much. Pleasure. We break now for tea. And back at uh, 4.30. Back at 4.30.